Before we begin, uh, I noticed that I haven't been saving enough time for questions. So, you know, as we get uh, more and more into the week, and maybe we're, we get more and more tired, um, we want to save a little energy for questions. And so, um, uh, we'll have a 15-minute break at uh, 3 o'clock. If, if I forget, please remind me. Uh, but maybe we'll even have another 15-minute uh, time period where we can have just general questions so everybody can hear the questions uh, as we go along. Let me set my alarm. Last night after the session, I went to the Nassau Inn. I don't know if you know where the Nassau Inn is. It's, you go down Nassau Street and to the right, and uh, I asked the nice lady there, where's the table that Einstein used to sit at? And uh, there is a table, and he carved his name into the table. And so if you ask the people there, they'll show you the table, and there's his name carved into the table. So uh, I'm hoping that I became a little smarter after I looked at that, and now we have a better talk. I, uh, I visited some friends in Cambridge uh, uh, less than a year ago, and they took me to a place where Isaac Newton was. And then my wife and I visited uh, uh, Alexandria, Virginia, and we went to a bar where George Washington uh, drank. And so I guess I've been drinking in a lot of bars lately. <laughs> <laughs> Famous bars. But Princeton's a special place. Anyway, we want to talk about uh, uh, a little bit more about turbulent combustion. Let me uh, finish. What I didn't finish uh, yesterday, uh, one of the projects that we're working on, along with a number of other groups, um, is uh, sponsored by the Air Force in this country. And they're pretty much worrying about um, complex fuels such as JP-8. And we can think of it as kerosene, uh, C-10, H-20. And um, uh, Hai Wang at Stanford um, is, um, uh, has postulated that maybe we can simplify how we handle these complex fuels. And um, he argues that you could do a lumped pyrolysis mechanism to get it, uh, the, this JP8 down into butane, ethylene, butene, propene. And these are fuels that are, uh, the, uh, many of these fuels are like, uh, uh, C4, H8, uh, um, you know, they're, they're uh, very similar to um, JP8 in the sense that they have uh, two hydrogens for every carbon, but then if you break apart the molecule, you get uh, smaller molecules. But the um, idea High has been uh, pushing is that there isn't any oxidation in this process, because if you start to burn um, JP directly, then you have just lots and lots of species. But if this JP8 breaks down into, let's say, five or six simpler fuels without oxidizing, we know how each of these simpler fuels oxidize. Uh, uh, butane, ethylene, these are simple C2H4. We know how the chemistry of these uh, um, uh, can be represented. And so, uh, this is sort of a, almost a done deal. Uh, at least it's pretty well done. But it's a huge assumption because we don't know if you can make this approximation. And uh, what the Air Force has said to Stanford is, let's do shock tube studies and let's look at the Arrhenius constants for all the possible reactions and maybe see if it's possible to, uh, to do this process. Obviously, uh, you have to have a physical situation where you don't get too much oxygen in with the fuel uh, right away. But that happens in many practical devices. But then the argument is you also need to do turbulent flame experiments. Okay, now why would you need to do turbulent flame experiments if this is all a big chemistry problem? Well, the answer is that the shock tube studies, you know, you put the fuel and the oxidizer in and you run it and it gives you these constants but uh, you don't have any idea what the residence time is in a real device. You know, um, just knowing the, the chemical reactions just tells you rates, but uh, the residence time tells you how much is actually produced. So in other words, if you know D, D by DT of the concentration of JP8, 
That's what Arrhenius will tell you. But you have to multiply that by a delta t to find the actual change in JPA. And in a, in a turbulent flame, we need to know the residence time, and we need to know the structure. If it's a big distributed reaction, and you have a lot of time for this JP8 to um, oxidize, or to uh, break down and then oxidize. But if it's a thin flamelet, you have a very short residence time. So that's why we need to do these kinds of experiments. And uh, uh, to finish up what I was saying last time, we have this burner. It's a big Bunsen burner. And uh, uh, we're doing uh, uh, something like this. And uh, Fokiana Gapopoulos at USC is doing some of this. And uh, other groups are doing this. But we take a, uh, a, um, an atomizer. So this is just a nozzle that you can buy that, uh, that forms a real fine spray. And then you put it through a, a cylinder that has a heating tape. And um, if you keep it warm enough, uh, you get vaporized JP8 out. And um, then you uh, put that into the turbulent flame, and um, it, it, it burns pretty much like the other fuels, except, uh, uh, I mean, it looks like the other fuels, but uh, um, there are some differences in the flame structure. Now, we haven't, we haven't done this yet. I mean, we've, we've burned it, but we haven't looked at the structure yet. So uh, there's a joint group of people who were working together to look at the structure. And now, last time I said if we, if we premix the fuel in the air, uh, we all know that we get a, a preheat region where things get hot. But at least uh, methane and some of these other species don't react very much here. And they wait till they get to the high temperature reaction zone back here. But when you have uh, JP8, most likely you're going to get um, a lot of reactions. They may not be heat release reactions, but they're going to be pyrolysis reactions. And I just drew this cartoon, but it may not be right. I mean, this may overlap. These two regions may overlap. But let's just say we start to get it warm, and we, we pyrolyze the fuel, and then we really preheat the, the, um, uh, the simple fuels up to an ignition temperature, and then they react. The question is, what's, what's going on in here? And the, the bigger question is, uh, can these simple chemistry uh, models, uh, um, do they really apply? So the, the goal, uh, of, uh, and, and uh, this, is, this is like a, a future goal that uh, a number of groups want to achieve, is um, you, you, you uh, uh, take laser uh, uh, beams, and in this case, we're just talking about a beam, and we go along a line. We're not doing imaging of a sheet, but just uh, along a line. And uh, now we're going to have to um, um, measure properties along this line, and then the flame is going to be sometimes here and sometimes not here. And so we just take thousands of images and hope we get some of them where the flame is uh, where we're looking. Okay, so that's difficult, but. But if we could, we'd like to know the species concentrations of all of these, all of these things. For example, Jet A itself, um, which is like JP8, uh, it fluoresces. A uh, number of people, um, Professor Seek at Michigan, uh, a number of other people have been able to get Jet A to fluoresce. And so if you shine the laser in, in this beam, you can determine the Jet A concentration. And I'm, I'm drawing it to, to somehow drop off as you go through this um, flame. Uh, toluene uh, is another species uh, that uh, fluoresces very nicely. Um, carbon monoxide can be uh, uh, measured uh, with a, a two-photon fluorescence process developed at Stanford. And of course, OH is, um, uh, fluoresces very nicely in many labs. But then there are other species people would like to know about. And here comes the hard part. We'd like to know the concentration of ethylene, acetylene, methane, hydrogen, o, uh, this is another OH, and, and CO2. Um, and the method that uh, has been suggested is to use CARS. That's coherent anti-stoke Raman scattering. Um, now, there are a few places in the world that do this, and they can do these kinds of profiles along a line. 
and the objective is now to do this in the future. But even if we could do it, we can't do all these things at the same time. So the idea would be is you would uh, take the lasers and fire them at, let's say, 10 hertz. And then uh, when we get a flame that happens to be in the right spot, we will measure the concentration of one species, or the, the, the mole fraction of one species, as, as well as the temperature. And there, we, we would use um, our cars for the temperature <clears throat> and fluorescence for, the, for this. Um, and then we would um, uh, do this uh, many times for different uh, laser frequencies, different, uh, uh, different concentrations of different species. But they'd all be done at different times. How do we put it all together? Well, uh, one thought is to then uh, uh, use temperature now as the x-axis instead of distance. And so um, if we plotted this curve versus this curve, you know, we would get a curve that, that would also drop off. And then if we did that thousands of times, we would get the time average of this curve versus temperature, let's say uh, jet A versus temperature. And then we do the same with methane, hydrogen, o OH, using cars. Now, you wouldn't have them all simultaneously in time, but you'd have them all at, uh, with temperature as the x-axis. And the chemists uh, feel that this is um, good information. They don't really care about the spatial distribution. They just want to know uh, how things vary with the temperature, and then they could assess their mechanism. Okay, so convert the x-axis to temperature, and then, um, then at the same time, we'd like to then know where in the flame are we. So if we do some of this, we could take some two-dimensional images and, and try to get the picture that I showed in the last slide. We'd also like to get this picture along with data on this line. So I'm not saying we did it. I'm just saying this is where the field is heading, and there's a big effort in the Air Force. And um, I think there'll be a lot of labs around the world that want to look at more complex fuels. Um, can you do this? Well, uh, uh, Professor Seek's lab in, um, at Michigan and in my lab, uh, these things have been measured, okay, uh, along lines. Um, in the, at, at AFRL, which is in Dayton, and at Purdue University, um, uh, which is uh, uh, near us, in the Midwest, uh, there have been people who have measured all of these species along a line. It's only about a, a two to three millimeter long line. You know, it's not that easy to do this, but they do it with cars. And so they've published papers and that uh, I've listed here. And so you say, can, can any of this be done? And um, it, it can. In fact, the first one is, uh, this is one of our speakers who's uh, shown that the, the, the fluorescence of kerosene can be done. Um, Stanford people, uh, Grish, worked with Ron Hansen. Uh, Simone Hockreb, she's at Cambridge, and she's done a Jet A. Barlow's at Sandia. Dreisler is at Darmstadt. Seek is at Michigan. And then uh, Jim Gord is this fellow who's an expert cars person uh, in Dayton. And Meyer is at Purdue. So it can be done if we all throw our lasers together and uh, you know, uh, help each other out. And that's sort of the idea. And th I'm not going to go over cars, because I think um, uh, it's beyond uh, what we want to discuss in, in this type of lecture. But the idea here is uh, if you want to image along a line with cars, you have to have a sheet of light that they call the pump laser. It excites a particular molecule up to an excited state. And then you disturb the, mo the um, excited molecule with a, a probe sheet. So this would be at a different wavelength. And it, is, uh, it crosses uh, the first sheet. And then uh, the beauty of cars is that you get light out that's coherent, which uh, in this case is going to be a sheet of light that comes out in some direction. And it will be a, a signal that is uh, proportional to the species concentration that you're looking for, if you can do all this. So you, yeah, good question. Yeah. 
Yes. 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 You know, yes, yeah, right. That's that's the point. The temperature is different, and um, um, but the car's temperature is a very well established technique, um, more established than than uh, the species. So, uh, I uh, that's a point. I didn't. Oh, the question was uh, with this particular method, you can get species, but you don't get temperature. With temperature, you you need something a little bit more complicated than this. And um, so this is only for uh, species. But uh, Jim Gord and Terry Meyer, uh, two people who have done this, um, uh, at least the people I know that have done this, and uh, they can get temperature as well. And just to, to prove it, uh, these are some papers. I've got them listed in, my, in the handouts. Uh, um, you can see that, at least in a laminar flame, where you, sh you should get, uh, you know, a constant value here along the profile, they get relatively constant values along these distances, and this is about two millimeters. And uh, they're working at extending it to longer than two millimeters. Um, they've calibrated it so they, you know, they they put it in a uh, in a in a gas where they know the amount of hydrogen, the amount of methane, and they get nice calibration curves. And uh, we'd like to uh, better understand these more complicated flames. So, so I, I, what I'm, I'm wrapping up here is that, you know, why do we buy these kilohertz lasers? What do you want to do with it? If you become an assistant professor, what proposal are you going to write to the governments of this country or other countries to get money to use this stuff? Um, there's a lot of wasted money because people don't yet fully know what to do with these kilohertz lasers, and maybe by going to summer school and thinking about this, you can be one of the people that actually puts these things to good use. Um, uh, Professor Kendall is talking about a highly unsteady periodic phenomena. Obviously, high-frequency kilohertz lasers are, are, are important. How to apply Professor Law's theory of flame stretch to highly turbulent flames? Okay, there again, uh, I think I said something yesterday about if you can get velocity gradients in, near the flame, and if you can do this in an unsteady manner, that would be great. You could see the f flame stretching. I think most of what I showed, most of what I showed yesterday was not unsteady, it was not uh, kilohertz, but there was the one study by by uh, Steinberg, where at low Reynolds numbers, he was able to uh, show some uh, vortices going through flames and being, uh, flames being stretched. Landau instability, other phenomena that we know about, how can we apply this to turbulent flames? It may be very, very important. Uh, the base of a lifted jet flame, the problem there is if you look at a lifted jet flame, it, it's always going to be jumping up and down. And it's going to, we need, uh, very good diagnostics. So maybe we need uh, kilohertz diagnostics and maybe 3, 3D plus unsteady. Uh, this problem has not been solved and we need diagnostics. Some people just use kilohertz to get more data quickly. You know, that gets you your thesis real quickly, but uh, why spend all that money? Um, the future Challenge is to add heavy hydrocarbon chemistry to do a DNS and uh, at Caltech, Alexei Polodnenko, Bell, and Jackie, uh, they're all doing this, uh, experiments at Princeton and USC. And last, your airplane flight here was not powered by methane, but by Jet A. So when we come to these combustion symposia, Let's see more real fuels. OK, so now I want to talk about models. And um, for some of you who are doing modeling, um, it may take a while before you uh, see something interesting, because I'm going to have to start early. But um, um, for the rest of you, uh, I'm going to start with some basics. And the steady strain laminar flamelet model for non premixed flames is, is a classic. It's been used by a number of people at the Sandia uh, TNF workshop. And I'll show you that it, uh, it's a work by uh, 
uh, Janneke in uh, Germany and it works really well. Um, it doesn't work perfectly, but it works really well. And there are other methods that uh, have been developed that um, the, the, the attempt is to be better than this steady strain laminar filament model, but I'm not sure that anything is better. They're different, and, but uh, let's not throw this one out just because it's a little bit older. It was, the ideas were started by Norbert, and uh, Heinz Pitch uh, developed this with his uh, group of people. And the idea is that um, uh, we know the uh, flamelet is not steady. You know, it's, it's doing things in an unsteady manner. But as it goes through these unsteady motions, do the actual profiles of carbon dioxide, fuel, everything, you know, these are, these are just curves that either go up or go down across a flame. Um, are the relative, uh, uh, the ratios of the profiles changing a lot because of the unsteadiness, or is it just uh, wrinkling in space? And um, uh, the evidence is that uh, you can do pretty well even though you assume a steady strain flame with um, flame with progress variables, though, uh, have, uh, have the mixture fraction Z, which I talked about, as well as the reactedness C, which tells you how close you are to completing the reaction it, um, um, uh, 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 for the limit of C of 1 is you're, you're close to equilibrium reactions and, and uh, uh, a fast chemistry. The other nice thing about this C is that if, if uh, if you have partially premixed combustion, well, this isn't going to work because um, this is all for non premixed only. Whereas this flamelet progress variable, I'll explain, it, is, has a lot of promise for uh, both premixed and non premixed because Z, the mixture fraction, is the fundamental parameter for non premixed flames. You know, it's the mass fraction of hydrogen atoms, and that's how we do non premix flames. C, the reactiveness, is the fundamental variable for premix flames. So the, the, uh, the, the hope is to combine both of these into a, something that can, can work whether you have premixed or non premixed, or if you have stratified uh, flames. So that's the future and the potential uh, payoff of this. Now, the three other methods that I don't think I'll say too much about. Uh, is anybody here using the PDF method, uh, Professor Pope's method? Okay, so you all know how to do it. Um, I think this is all I'm going to say because uh, 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 it's, it's maybe a little too complicated to discuss. It's used quite a bit, certainly at the Sandia group, but if you just imagine, uh, if, if you're not familiar with it, uh, if you imagine putting parcels into a turbulent flow, little uh, volumes, thousands of them, and you let them convect along with the flow. You have all these thousands of little parcels moving along, and you tell them to move at the velocity field determined by the uh, momentum equation. But then you say uh, there's a certain mixing time. After a certain time, you're going to let these parcels mix with each other. So you can just imagine two parcels near each other, and you say, well, this one's mostly fuel, this one's mostly air. We're just sort of They'll trade their concentrations a little bit. And Professor Pope has figured out a way to have these parcels mix. Now, he has to make some decisions, like, like after how much time do we say it mixes, because it's discrete mixing. And then when they mix, uh, how much of one mixes with how much of the other. And um, uh, then uh, what you end up with is a very nice situation where you have these little parcels that are of different concentrations, different temperatures, because the temperatures have mixed. But then if you've ever done Chemkin, you know, you can do a well-stirred reactor for a, a little parcel of completely mixed fluid, and it has a certain temperature, it has a certain um, a concentration of species, and there's a certain time. You run, let's say, a, a well-stirred reactor, and you get the chemistry perfectly done for that parcel. And so after it mixes, you have it undergo chemistry for a little while, and then it moves to another spot. So uh, in, a, in a short way to describe it, you 
put these parcels in, and for a certain time you let them convect, you, for a certain time you let them mix, and then at a certain time you let them react, and then they go on their way and repeat. Um, if you can get the proper times and the proper mixing rates, you get the chemistry exact, because um, for that little parcel, we know exactly what that chemistry is going to do. OK, um, but let's start right from the beginning. If, you, if, if you've taken a combustion course, you may have seen this. Um, um, suppose I say there's a, I have a non-premixed jet flame, so the jet of fuel moving to the right. Uh, Quo uh, explains that you could solve the laminar jet flame equations, uh, momentum and uh, mixture fraction, and you'd get a uh, set of formulas, which are very nice. But the very simplest idea is to take the molecular diffusivity D, replace it with some new number, the turbulent diffusivity D sub T. So we're saying the only thing that turbulence does is to increase the diffusivity. Now, the diff turbulent diffusivity, we argue, is the u prime, the velocity fluctuation, times the integral scale. Now, you can show that in a jet, um, d sub t is constant everywhere, because you, as you go downstream in a jet, uh, the velocity fluctuations decrease, but the integral scale increases as the jet gets wider. And they both do it linearly, so uh, one, do, one does it, uh, it, it increases linearly and it drops as 1 over x uh, in u prime. So d sub t is constant. So uh, I've taken, uh, this is Quo's um, approximate solution. It, it's not good at uh, x, x equals 0 because uh, when x equals 0, this blows up. But um, downstream of the core, um, that you get a, 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 a formula like this, where this uh, xi is a uh, is a uh, basically a r over x, and um, now if you put uh, dt here, um, you plug in dt. Now dt, I said, is uh, uh, u prime over u prime times the integral scale, and if we use the center line velocity fluctuation. We can say the u center prime on the center line is proportional to the u on the center line. They both drop as you go downstream. And the integral scale uh, increases linearly with x as the shear layer grows. At this. And so uh, you've seen this argument that uh, the x cancels out, and we get um, the d sub f and the u sub f, and these are constants. So uh, this is independent of x. So if we take that and we plug it in here, then that's the same as the numerator is the same as the denominator. These two cancel out. These two cancel out. And we just say that the mixture fraction drops off as uh, d uh, is x to the minus 1. And if we do this on the center line, uh, that's when uh, xi is equal to 0. And so, again, these two cancel out. So we just say that the center line mixture fraction drops off like that. Um, and the nice thing about this solution, and at least it gives us an understanding of what's happening, because another equation that uh, comes from the, uh, this is, comes from the continuity equation, is, is that uh, the uh, radial velocity is simple. And you can see that it has a, has a couple of complicated terms here with cubes and squared. But if you plot it, it the curve looks like this. So the radial mean velocity is 0 on the center line of the jet. It has to be. It has to be 0 far away. But then in this region here, you have radially outward flow. And then if you go high enough here, you have radially inward flow. And so the, the streamlines plotted in Schlichting's classic textbook look like this. So this gives us the idea of the entrainment of the air into the jet. and. The flame location now, you get this. This curve can be plotted by setting z equal to z stoichiometric in that formula that I had in the last slide. And um, you, if you, you do that, you get this exact curve. And then where this, uh, this curve uh, goes to 0 at r equals 0, you set r equals 0. And uh, you get the length of the flame is just proportional to d sub f. 
divided by the uh, stoichiometric mixture fraction. And this very nicely uh, agrees with the experiment. Okay, so why do we even model these flames? Well, first of all, this is, um, it does have a number of assumptions in them, and um, uh, uh, this whole analysis uh, to get these simple equations only applies to the most simple problem, the, 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 the jet. And so this is not a robust method, it's just kind of a, a way to proceed. So uh, Lockwood at Imperial College many years ago uh, used the K-epsilon model, and this is the next level of complexity. You take the same equations. Uh, this is now he, uh, this is a mom momentum equation um, where U is in the axial direction. Uh, there's a continuity equation, which I guess I didn't write, that gives you the radial velocity, if you know the axial velocity. And F he uses is, that's the same as Z, the mixture fraction. But again, it's uh, convection and diffusion and no source term. Then, um, uh, to get this uh, turbulent diffusivity, he's arguing we don't just set it constant everywhere in space we can actually compute what the diffusivity is doing at each location in a complicated flow pattern. But we have to know K, and we have to know epsilon. And I showed earlier that epsilon is related to the integral scale, <clears throat> and K is something you can solve from the K equation, which comes from the Navier-Stokes equations with a, a couple of modeling assumptions to get these terms simple. And here's the, the source terms where the K is uh, destroyed. But it's a, uh, it's a closed set of equations. You get, uh, you get the, the mean axial velocity. You get the mean radial velocity. You get uh, the mean mixture fraction from the F equation. Now, you need another equation for the variance, because at any point, you need the mean and the variance of, of this F. To, and you plug it into the PDF and you're on your way. Uh, so you need a G equation, you need K and an epsilon, and rho bar comes from the state relation and P is constant. And if you look at all the uh, quantities in these equations, that's, that's all you need. And so the, the, F, the epsilon equation is this one, um, um, and the G equation is this one. Again, they're derived in the, uh, and used in fluent, and the viscosity uh, we, we argued was this. But now he assumes unstrained laminar flamelets. So um, let's say he wants the mean temperature at a point. He would, he would uh, plug everything into this equation. So um, you need the mean temperature. You mean, need the mean density. You, you need other mean properties to solve the equations. But you have uh, Z bar. That should be T is a function of Z bar and the variance. Uh, that's not equal there. Um, and um, so you need uh, uh, a state relation for T as a function of Z at any instant. And then you need a, a PDF that is a function of Z bar and the variance. And if you know Z bar and the variance at the point, you can plug all this in and determine the mean temperature. And so uh, 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 last time we talked about the state relations and the dotted lines are the fast chemistry state relations. You could just put uh, two straight line curves in for this. Um, um, and um, you have to assume P to be uh, some assumed shape like a beta function. But if you do that, then uh, from the equation, you get Z bar and Z prime squared, and you, you're closed. Okay. The nice thing about this analysis, it sounds really simple, but uh, we can measure all of these terms in these equations, and I keep saying that. Uh, we can measure that state relation. We can measure most of these things. Uh, uh, we can measure G. It's a fluctuation in the, in the mixture fraction with the Raman scattering, and they've done that at Sandia. Epsilon's harder to measure, but with, with, uh, with really high quality uh, um, PIV, um, uh, you can get a handle on that, and uh, 
all of these terms you can pretty much measure. And so if, if it's terribly wrong, you know, somebody can figure that out. So these simple models are kind of nice that way. Um, and this is what he gets. He gets, when he solves this, he gets the mean velocity dropping on center line. He gets uh, the mixture fraction drops along center line as things mix. Uh, this is uh, with combustion. This is non premixed combustion. Uh, the mean temperature goes up and goes down. And again, he's using a lookup table to get, to get from like, mean temperature to mean, a mean mixture fraction to mean gas temperature. He's using that integral that I just showed you. And he can get this. Um, he says going up and go down, which means he's going on the two sides of the state relation. And he can get the turbulence level dropping off, which you hope is about the right amount. Now, uh, this would be the end of the story, except that he didn't use strained flamelets, and so this flame can never extinguish. And um, they do find that things like carbon monoxide and other things are not right. Even the temperature is too high. And so the uh, Norbert Peters and his group argue, well, let's do the same thing, but we'll put a strain flamelet in and for this uh, for, this, uh, for this function here, we, we, we run Chemkin again, but we put some strain on it, and we drop the, the temperature from the dotted line down to the solid line, and all the mass fractions jump to different lines, and we just you know, put in a new function here and do the same thing. And, uh, uh, but now the question is, uh, how do you relate uh, strain to all of this? And so... Um, we can define the scalar dissipation rate this way. Um, uh, Bilger is the one who proposed this. Uh, D is the molecular diffusivity. Um, uh, dz dx is the, um, the gradient in the mixture fraction. And um, the bar is over the squared term, so you first have to determine this, and then you square it, and then you take the bar. You have to be careful when you do that. And you get um, um, a something that's called the scalar dissipation rate. And it, it, uh, it turns out it's, it's, it's one of the terms in the G equation. And so it, uh, it's basically the mixing rate. It's, it's a mixing rate. Okay, so, so all we're doing now is we have two variables. Instead of Z, we have Z and chi. And so how is all this related? Well. Uh, I thought I'd put up Norbert Peters' idea here. Um, uh, it, this is a real simple uh, uh, model, and it's not what Chemkin uses, but uh, just to help our understanding, Chemkin does something like this, except it, it uh, of course, uh, um, uh, doesn't make any of these assumptions that we're going to make here. But um, suppose we had a, a constant density flow the velocity is not disturbed by the heat release. All species diffuse the same way. Everything is at Lewis number one. Now, we, uh, we've set up this flow field like this. And you can actually run an experiment and show that the flame is very, very flat. And so all scalars are uniform along any horizontal line. Uh, the velocity field changes in 2D, but the scalar field is uh, 1D. And so uh, uh, the continuity equation looks like this. And you can then determine the strain rate, which, is, um, um, you, uh, uh, which you get from this, which is uh, epsilon x. So uh, if we take uh, du dx and, um, in this problem, that's a strain rate. And uh, we, we say du dx um, uh, u is, um, I skipped that step, but u is proportional to x, and so u is equal to epsilon x, where epsilon is a constant of proportionality. Then if you put that in, then v has to be equal to minus epsilon y for this to hold. Then uh, you can write the, the z equation. And this is for a laminar case. And so this is the laminar diffusivity. And th this is particularly simple because uh, um, uh, dz dx um, is uh, 0. Now, let me see. Um, I'm defining. I didn't put that on here, but y is actually the vertical direction. And uh, v is the vertical velocity. And x, oh, well, here's the x here. 
Anyway, um, so this term is zero, and uh, now we have uh, a dz dy, and we have an, a minus epsilon y when we remove that, and we have a d here. And so um, uh, Norbert many years ago showed that uh, you can solve this now for the profiles through this simple uh, counterflow flame, and you get er an error function. So um, if you have a, a fuel down here and you have air up here, you're going to go from pure fuel to pure air. And where you get to Z stoichiometric, which is like 0.06, that's where the flame is. And um, uh, OK, I tried to draw this. This is for low strain rate, high strain rate. The gradient's a little larger. I don't know if you can see that, but this could be a sharper gradient. So if you um, have higher velocities um, impinging on each other, you get higher strain rates. OK, so now this epsilon, the strain, the strain rate is just a velocity gradient. But now the scalar dissipation rate is a scalar gradient. But since you know the scalar field here, you could just take the derivative of z in the y direction, and that'd be only this term right here. These other two would be 0. You could then determine chi at this point here, the stoichiometric dissipation rate. Chi would look like this, um, the, the, the gradient of this curve. And at the stoichiometric case, at the flame, it would be this value. So we can, we can say from this analysis that the dissipation rate is proportional to the velocity gradient, the strain rate. Okay, and so um, you can even write equations for this. And you can, you can say, you know, where is the flame or what y location would the flame be? Well, it's where uh, z equals the stoichiometric value. And so you can get that equation. So you show that if you increase the diffusivity, uh, you increase the y location where the flame is. And uh, you can discuss the strength of, the fl of a non premixed flame. It's, it's, it's defined as the mass flux of fuel at the flame boundary. Okay, that's one definition. So we, we know that if the gradients are larger, there'll be more flux of fuel into the flame. There'll be more burning of the fuel uh, per unit area and uh, by fixed law. And so we just simply uh, use this as a measure of how strong the diffusion flame is. And uh, if you determine this number from that error function solution, you get that the strength of the flame, not surprisingly, is increases as you strain it more. So if you apply a larger velocity gradient, you get the fuel going into the flame faster because of Fick's law, because this, this gets larger. And if you increase the diffusivity, um, then because of this, you, you will also get a larger um, uh, strength of the flame. But this can't go on forever. Eventually, the flame get, is extinguished and goes out. And finally, for this little uh, mathematical example, uh, we can say that since, by definition, the dissipation rate is, is this, and we know uh, how z is a function of y, and we know um, um, how the strain rate is a function of y, we can uh, manipulate this to show that, again, the scalar dissipation rate is proportional to the strain rate. And uh, we can even figure out what the thickness of a strained flame is. Um, it's if we, if we say that the, uh, the, the mixture fraction drops from this point to this point, and we put a line through it like this, then when, it, uh, when this line hits uh, this axis and where this line uh, uh, actually hits uh, this point right here where it's, where it's uh, flat here, we call that, we define that as the thickness of the flame. And we, again, use our error function solution to show that um, the thickness of a non premix flame is, uh, it increases as you increase the diffusivity, which is what you would expect. And if you increase the dissipation rate and strain rate, you make it thinner. Okay, so um, 
Norbert Peters put all this together, and he said, well, now I'm going to, I'm going to imagine that uh, right in here, um, this is a segment of a turbulent flame. That's a pretty drastic assumption, because we're going to say it's a steady counterflow flame. We're going to represent a segment of a, of a turbulent flame by a steady counterflow flame. Um, uh, the other uh, issue, of course, is that uh, um, there is some vorticity present, and the counterflow flame velocity field has no vorticity. Okay, so that's an, that's an approximation that we're making that, uh, that, um, that this counterflow velocity field is what's happening near, near turbulent flame. And um, so you run, the, uh, you run Kemkin, and you find that if you run the counterflow flame and the dissipation rate increases, the temperature will drop. Something like the mass fraction of CO will also change because uh, uh, with highly strained flames, they're thin, and they don't have enough residence time to, to burn everything. And so you could uh, cause dissipation to high dissipation can make uh, some of the CO uh, concentration go down. Or it, it, it depends on the situation, but you could have a, a variation in the mass fraction of CO with dissipation rate. Um, so we're going to lower the peak temperature by applying um, strain. It alters the mass fractions. But we're still going to call this a flamelet. It's only now it's a strain flame, flamelet. Uh, it may reduce the uh, chemical reaction rate it, because as the temperature goes down, uh, there's an Arrhenius dependence, an exponential dependence that, that causes uh, um, the reaction rate to go down. But, um, but now, uh, this uh, uh, effective strain on the uh, carbon monoxide is, is a realistic thing. I mean, um, and so it, you, you hope that uh, you improve the prediction of both the temperature and the CO by putting strain in. And um, so how well does all this work? Uh, I, I picked a paper by Yannicka, uh, uh, who's one of the leaders in this area. And um, uh, he did a, uh, he's done um, Simulations of Sandia Flame D at, at different levels of fidelity. He's done uh, RAND simulations where Reynolds average Navier Stokes, or he's done uh, LES, which means um, uh, uh, basically unsteady conservation equations. And um, in this particular paper, this is an LES, but he's using a steady strain laminar flamelet. LES submodel, which is about as simple as you can get for LES. And uh, so it's, it's all the same thing we just were saying. The, the, you use a, 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 a mixture fraction equation. Um, he, he, um, he needs the uh, variance of the dissipation rate and the variance of the of, uh, 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 of the mixture fraction. So, um, so to summarize the closure on this approach, you have to assume a shape to the PDF. Um, so um, he assumes a beta function because it, it does have these wide range of possible shapes, which I showed. And it seems to agree with experiments. But it has a mean and a variance, so at each point, you can't define the PDF unless you have those two, you need those two numbers. And that would be the PDF of mixture fraction. You also need the PDF of scalar dissipation rate. So let me go back uh, one here. Uh, there are really two PDFs here. Um, um, since the uh, lookup table, the uh, state relation uh, formula uh, graph is a function of Z and chi, um, we, need, we need to integrate this over D chi and DZ. And um, we assume the two PDFs are statistically independent. Uh, uh, this, um, has, this PDF has a mean and a variance of 
mixture fraction, and this has a mean and a variance of the um, dissipation rate. We assume this PDF is a beta function, and we assume this dissipation rate is a log normal because it seems to work. So the whole problem is to get the mean and variance at each point, but you need the mean and variance of both z and chi. And that's what he did. Um, you get the mean z from the conservation equation for z bar. You need the variance from what some people call the g equation or the scalar fluctuations. And that's an equation that I put up just a little while ago. The uh, mean scalar dissipation rate, well, you could write a, an equation for it. I mean, but then you'd be writing equations forever, you know, because uh, uh, any quantity you can just say convection, diffusion, and source, and sink. Um, but the trouble is, you, then you're going to have a source and a sink term for the dissipation rate. So people say, well, enough is enough. And we just go to an algebraic equation to get the mean dissipation rate. And so uh, Yannicka goes this way and Fluent goes this way just to, to say that uh, the, um, the um, mean scalar dissipation rate is proportional to epsilon. Now, epsilon is the velocity dissipation rate. So they both have the word dissipation rate in it. This is the scalar gradient, and this is the velocity gradient, um, sort of, uh, in terms of the k epsilon formalism. And z prime squared uh, is, is, uh, is what we get from what we call the g equation. And k is what we get from the k equation. So uh, this is a constant. So by saying that dissipation rate is proportional to epsilon with this equation, we're closing the equations. And we still need the uh, variance of the uh, uh, dissipation. This gives you the mean of the dissipation rate. We still need its variance, um, uh, this quantity prime squared. But um, in, in uh, Fluent and in uh, Yannicka's model, they just assume it to be zero, and it seems to work. But if you didn't like that, you could, you know, there's some models with a slightly different uh, algebraic equation for the variance of dissipation rate. Um, but in any case, we've got a bunch of differential equations, and now we have some algebraic equations that help us out, and we're um, closed. So Yannicka did a really nice job, and he got much better agreement with Sandia Flame D than uh, previous models, even though this is considered to be a fairly simple LES model. And um, you got fluctuations in Z. I don't know if you can see this, but the fluctuations look pretty good. The mean mixture fraction, that drops off nicely, but we were able to get that with our incredibly simple uh, uh, equations that I talked about earlier. So that's no big deal. Uh, the temperature, this is a big deal because uh, um, it, he's getting good agreement with the temperature, whereas uh, the other uh, non-strained non uh, case uh, did not get good agreement with temperature. And so you want to get the temperature right because the chemistry depends on temperature. Um, let's see, OH looks pretty good, I think. The experiments of the dots and here, this is, uh, and uh, water looks good. That's not too hard to get. And CO2 looks real good. I guess I would say, uh, let's see, uh, did I plot here? Oh, uh, OH, I'm looking for CO. Yeah, yeah, okay. Sorry, it's on the right hand side. This is CO2, and this is CO, okay. CO is here. This is really nice. Uh, this is the, I think, maybe one of the first and better models to get the CO right, at least of this type. And uh, the other thing he was able to do is show that the PDFs, uh, this is the, um, the LES PDF and the experimental PDF. Um, this is a beta function. Uh, oh, this is a PDF of the dissipation rate. I'm sorry. So this is a log normal. And uh, 
he was able to show that the shape of the PDF, this log normal shape or scalar dissipation rate is uh, about right. Okay, then uh, um, some of you may be following this literature more closely than anybody else here, but um, uh, what's reported is that the, on the fuel rich size, the hydrogen and CO were not quite as good as what I showed you. So, um, you know, you could say, well, let's just stop and quit and why go to any more complicated models? This model runs very quickly and is simple to understand. We could measure the terms of validate it, verify it, and use it. Um, um, but no, more models keep coming up. And this is a, uh, a progress variable model. And again, it's, um, it's uh, um, one by uh, Hasse. Um, uh, this is another uh, German uh, scientist. Um, and it's been published in Combustion and Flame. And it's a, uh, uh, they, they define a new progress variable. Uh, instead of using temperature, they define um, this quantity uh, that's a sum of the mass fractions of these four species. And uh, they present arguments why you'd want to do that. From a modeling point of view, it really doesn't matter how you define these variables. If they work, uh, there, there maybe uh, uh, isn't a whole lot of uh, uh, agreement on that this is how you should define the progress variable, but it's one way to do it. And then you can write a progress variable equation. Again, it's a convection, diffusion, and then a source term. And this is all in the subgrid scale, so it's, it's only for the inside the little um, cells to resolve everything on the corners of the cells. Anyway, um, this uh, Freiburg work um, also agrees with the Sandia measurements. Um, 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 I'm not going to comment on whether it's better or worse. I mean, they all look pretty good, and I think uh, um, it's good that uh, maybe two approaches give all of this good information. I mean, obviously things are working pretty well if you can get all these curves to be in the, um, um, very close to the measurements. And uh, again, the CO, which is the real critical thing, looks like that agrees pretty well too. So uh, we know the CO is not in a fast chemistry limit, and so um, the fact that these are strained flames and uh, um, get the CO is a good thing. So this is a real success story, I think. If you, if you um, want to read more about it, um, there are t lots and lots of measurements at the TNF website. It's taken years and years of people uh, to, uh, people's work to get this data. Some of it's done at Sandia, and some of it is done at uh, Darmstadt by Andreas Dreisler. Some of it's done um, in Sydney by uh, Professor Masri. But uh, they have single point diagnostics to get the F is the mixture fraction, Z, temperature, all the species mass fractions, and even nitric oxide, and, and then velocity using uh, um, mostly uh, LDV because laser velocimetry because they only need single point measurements and um, they can sit there and measure that mean velocity uh, for a long time and get really accurate data. Okay. Um, put down two papers I think are really good. Um, you may want to... Um, you may want to look them up sometime um, if this is interesting to you. Uh, I just don't want you to just jump into, if, you, if you're not familiar with this, I don't want you to just jump in and uh, look for papers because it can be pretty irritating and depressing, right? I mean, you look at all these papers, they don't make any sense. Uh, if you start with these, I guarantee you'll get, 
get somewhere. The, the last one here is a review paper by the best people, and it's in progress energy and combustion science. So they've taken a lot of time to sort of digest everything they've done and have a big long paper, and uh, you know it's like uh, 50 some pages long. You know you're going to be happy with that one, and the, the Barlow paper there that's a really good paper. It sort of summarizes everything he d has done in a long time. So you know, if you're going to jump into this, that's a good that's a good starting point. Anyway. Why don't we take a 15 minute break and I think then maybe I'll even uh, take some questions. So if you have any questions either now or in 15 minutes, we can address them. <laughs> 